welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. As a creative leader, then we need to be able to create the space and environment for people to be able to put ideas forward and to be able to hear those ideas, to be able to know what to do with them, to look at how they are in the context of the business that you have, how do you take those ideas and, and work them or how, or maybe they're not appropriate right now. However, they might be down the track. How do you store ideas? How do you let people know that their ideas are valued? But right now, you know, that idea can't get up and running for various sorts of reasons. So, you, again, as a leader, you need to be able to have a very good understanding of, your, of the purpose of your organisation, where it's going, and how these ideas fit or don't fit at this point in time, but also to encourage people to continue to be able to bring their most creative selves to the work that they do and that you really value that. Hi there, Innovator. It's great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I trust too that you enjoyed my recent conversations with Rob Rawson, the CEO and co-founder of Time Doctor, and with Mark Helpert, LinkedIn branding expert. I'm really excited today to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Dr. Catherine Lloyd. She's the founder and director of Maverick Minds. Catherine is a facilitator, an educator, a researcher, an arts practitioner, and a creative development coach. She is, in fact, Australia's first certified creativity coach with the Creativity Coaching Association, and she provides effective learning experiences for a wide variety of clients. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, that's InnovaBiz, where we help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience, and connect with their ideal client. That requires absolute clarity about who your ideal clients are and how you can help them. To help you get that clarity about your ideal client, take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class, where in less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity on your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. Access the Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. In our discussion today, Catherine talked to me about the intersection between the arts and business and what one can learn from the other and vice versa. She explained the best ways to harness creativity and in particular building creative leadership in organisations and in communities. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Catherine Lloyd. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Brisbane in Australia, Dr. Catherine Lloyd, who's the founder and director of Maverick Minds. Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, Catherine. It's a real privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you for the invitation, Jürgen. It's lovely to be here. Bob Dick, who was our guest on episode 236 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you. So a big shout out to Bob. Hello, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> now, Catherine, you're a facilitator, an educator, a researcher, an arts practitioner, and a creative development coach. You're Australia's first certified creativity coach, which is fascinating that such a thing exists. I didn't know that. And your company, Maverick Minds, specializes in creative learning experiences designed to help shift thinking, give people new perspectives and create positive change in the world and particularly develop more creativity in leaders. So I'm really 
looking forward to delving into all of those things today and unpacking some of that. But before we start talking about creativity and creative leadership and change, give us a bit of a high level um, snapshot of your background and how did you get to where you are today and what were some of the key moments in that journey? Mm. Uh, it, it, they're interesting questions, aren't they, in terms of how a career develops? And I wish I could say, in some ways, I wish I could say it was a very, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I knew exactly, you know, that I was going to go down this pathway. And um, yes, I could see every little stepping stone along the way, but it's definitely not like that. And I think in terms of like work around facilitation, I'm not sure that anybody necessarily has that as a career destination or that in mind. But maybe that's changing, interestingly enough. I, I wonder now that possibly that could be changing because we're moving into a world of more conversation around facilitation and the notion of facilitation and what that can do uh, in terms of uh, leadership and um, working with groups and things like that. So I think potentially facilitation is becoming a... a uh, a pathway in terms of what people will do with their professional life. And so for me, my background is in the arts and I've always been in the arts for you know, a very long time, did art at school and then went to art college and worked for a period of time as, in, as a designer in a couple of organisations uh, but very quickly, um, in my very early 20s, I started my own business. So I think I had a fairly entrepreneurial spirit at a very young age. And, and I think when you work in the arts and, and creatively, you need to have that entrepreneurial spirit because jobs don't really exist in some respects mm. and in, in that regard. And, and, again, I think that's changing in terms of the nature of how design is changing and digital technology is changing things but certainly you know at the beginning of my career that that digital world didn't exist in the same way that it does now and so the arts I think was a different field so I trained as a graphic designer originally but I realized I really didn't want to be a graphic designer I actually was interested more in um in, in art, visual art, um, and so explored that and that took me on a pathway, you know, in all sorts of ways of a combination of art and design and um, education as well. So I developed um, programs for visual artists and craft practitioners in terms of business development because I've always had an interest in business as well as the arts and I think that people forget that the arts actually have a very strong business side to them and we often think of the arts as being a bit fluffy and woolly and it's just creative and it's fun and it's play and it's all of those sorts of things which it is and needs to be but there's a very strong business focus to the arts as well and if you want to earn a living out of the arts then you also need to have a strong business mindset and entrepreneurial spirit to do that whether you're a solo practitioner or you're a company uh, an arts organisation that exists and developing that that organisation and developing a product for an audience, uh, that all requires business now and um, an entrepreneurial endeavour. Mm. Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, looking back in probably my last 20 or so years, uh, showing my age a little bit, but the um, what's happened in the arts uh, sphere in Australia, I think, is reflective of that recognition that there's a lot more business involved in arts and presenting arts, like understanding, you know, the audience and the different audiences and what they like and what their expectations are, and and also in managing the way that various programs are funded and and how they train new blood for the artists as well so there's a lot of that um there isn't there and and i think what you said i i had to laugh a little bit when you said that you know everybody thinks of art as playful and that but there's a lot of business like that and i thought you could turn that round on its head and say everybody thinks of business is really serious but there is a bit of playfulness to it isn't there so yeah. both, both areas can learn from one another 
Well, indeed, and that's a beautiful question, you know, back to or, or response back to how did I get into the work that I do now? And I think that was the question that I had. So I left Australia and moved overseas for a, a few years. And in that shift, and I was ready to make a change in my career, and I really wasn't sure what that was, but I knew I wanted to work creatively. And fortunately, um, I took on a role when I moved to the UK and I was based in London and I ended up at um, the University of Arts London at, at Central St Martin's College of Art and Design and I took on a role as their professional training manager and that role was to develop training programs and workshops for corporate clients who were interested in art and design and how we could offer our services to to a wider audience and that was fascinating because it was how do we take these creative products and then turn that into something that organisations, businesses would be interested in learning from and knowing about. So some of it was quite technical but what, one of the things that we started to develop were things around creative thinking and, um, and communication and other sorts of business associated ideas but linked to the creative world of of all of these areas of the of of, of design uh, photography uh, jewelry um, fashion so those worlds have their own way of um, looking at things and business can learn a lot from all of those fields and how they go about doing their business and what's the creativity that sits behind that. And that was fascinating to me. And so when I returned to Australia, I knew that I wanted to stay working in this connection between the creative world and arts and business and what was that. And I wasn't really 100. I knew I had some ideas, but those jobs don't really exist. And they certainly didn't exist <laughs> yeah. in Australia when I came back. So it was really having to kind of dig deep and think about what that really meant and to start to do some more research and which is what I did and uh, an investigation and of course I had made a lot of contacts in the UK which was great because then I had people to go back to and refer to and talk to and there was some foundation there but I needed to explore that further and one of the ways that I actually did that was to go and undertake my doctoral research at QUT and look at how the arts can be used in the context of individual and organisational learning and development and drawing on the arts as a way of engaging people in organisational life in different sorts of ways. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, I guess I'm fascinated in particular at the photography part of it. I mean, I was going to ask the question, how, do you, how did you then bring those artistic endeavours in and how did you help people take lessons away from that in a non-artistic environment, if you like. And and the one that particularly interests me is the photography one, because that's one of my hobbies always has been. So, yeah, so I guess that's the question. How, how did you kind of bring the lessons from the creative endeavours into a corporate environment where it was perhaps a fairly serious business environment? Well, one of the clients that we had was the BBC and so the BBC would come and uh, work with our photographers to help them to think about their photography in different sorts of ways and to get a shift in their thinking around how they did their photography, um, what, what was some innovation around photography, what were different ways that they could approach you know, doing their photography. So that's just one example in that regard. So there's the, there was the creative side of it. But, of course, there were people who came then to also learn about, well, how do, you, how do you create a business around doing photography as well? So it was a bit of both where we had, mm. you, know, the, you know, people wanting to create businesses out of photography but also businesses who needed to think more creatively about how they did what they did. And so, for instance, we had... Um, Sony come to us when they were working on a video game, very early video game, and we worked with the drama school to help them to develop characters and um, and and, uh, and and voices and things like that and stories to so that they could think about their their gaming from a more um, humanistic perspective because some of their 
the way that they were approaching it was actually it was very technical and mm. had, it was quite one-dimensional in a way. So they needed to bring that alive with a much more humanistic way of being and so it was getting people moving and playing and being in character and things like that to actually understand how do people respond in these situations, what do people do, rather than it just being a purely intellectual thing, it actually yeah. became an embodied experience of of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that reminds me a lot of the, um, you know, in the marketing sense where we've got so much automation and um, artificial intelligence now available to us through the technology that enables some wonderful things to be done in marketing and even in sales. But people are, you know, there's a big risk that people abdicate to the technology and forget about the human interaction part. So I think that's that's a, a really good parallel of that where um, people thought, oh, we can build this game and it's all about the intellectual part of it and the the techno technological challenges to build a game and they forget about what the experience what the human experience is that the Indeed. player wants to experience absolutely and that's why i think what i've seen develop over the last few years so when i started my research and was looking at the i mean people thought i was speaking a foreign language particularly here <laughs> yeah. Australia, um, you know, there were things, of course, happening overseas, but here was a little bit sort of behind in that regard. And so people couldn't wrap their head around, you know, well, how could the arts possibly influence or, or be of use to, to business, business world or business life? And so my research was, and there wasn't a lot around in the literature even, because practitioners, professional practitioners don't really or weren't writing about their practice then. They were just doing stuff. And so, you know, I was talking to the people that I knew, you know, back o in overseas and gathering their stories and what they did and what was their practice. And slowly I started to see practitioners write about their practice and to kind of show what they were doing in a different sort of way and to be more I uh, probably intentional and deliberate in some respects about what they were doing and really starting to kind of, I think theorise around it and intellectualise around it, but also to still have that practical way of of approaching things, which is still really important to to the work. Is to at the end of the day, it needs to be practical. How do you apply this, you know, on a day to day basis? And um, and I think that's you know that's the important element here is always bringing it back to how can this be applied, and um, and what's the value here too in that regard. I want to talk a little bit about creative leadership um, and what you understand by that. But before we do that, um, let me ask you about facilitation because you mentioned that facilitation now it's starting to be a little bit more recognised as a kind of a mainstream profession, if you like. Um, how How is facilitation different than, say, a consultant that, you know, we might have referred to in the past or um, a trainer? that you know perhaps in the past people in business will be really familiar with their roles in in a typical business environment yeah there there is a distinction and i think facilitation is quite broad and it is very much about working with others and to create a space for people to come together and to i think design processes and potentially ways of being that enable the group to do what it is that they need to do. So, so the processes will be different depending on who the group is and what is it that they're endeavouring to do. It's not a one-size-fits-all or, um, you know, this kind of tick-in-the-box way of doing things. It's a very dynamic way of working. I think that's that's what I would really think is at the heart of facilitation is recognising how dynamic it really is um, and emergent as well. It's a very emergent sort of practice in that regard. So to me, facilitation is that you go in with a sense of inquiry and curiosity to endeavour to understand what it is that people are trying to do and, to, and together and, yes, you know, as a facilitator you come in with some processes and ways of working and some methodologies that could be useful for the group, but you also need to be able to let go of those 
as as things emerge from the group. So really it's mm. about helping them to get to the heart of what it is that they're needing and wanting to do. And it may well be that the process that you came in with doesn't isn't necessarily appropriate anymore. And so you need to be able to work in a way that is responsive to, to their needs. So it's different to training, which is training is that, you know, there's probably a, partic- a very particular outcome that needs to happen or somebody needs to be able to use something, do something, and you need to know that they have the skills and capability to actually do that and you're training them to do something. So by the end of it, you know, people know that they're capable of doing that particular sort of thing. So I would never think that you train anybody to do leadership. You know, that mm. is a, that is a dynamic and evolving way of being, whereas if you need to learn how to do, you know, a piece of technology or, um, you know, drive a truck or, you know, whatever it is, those sorts of things that, that there are certain skills that you need in order to be able to do that particular task, I think it is. That's where training comes in. And there's learning attached to that, but it's also learning is attached to facilitation, but it's very different. And it's also, I think it's it's a, an individual um, engagement as well as a collective engagement in that regard. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's a really good explanation, and I guess in some ways, perhaps the training part, where it's very structured training with a black and white outcome, if you like. You know, there's a, a three out, perhaps three outcomes, and if the tick boxes are checked, then it's worked. If not, then it hasn't uh, hasn't delivered the outcome. And to me, that's a little bit, or I guess, a lot more transactional than the facilitation approach, which is almost like enabling an experience where people challenge themselves and kind of teach themselves what it is they need to know and and by actually practicing it and being what it is yes absolutely and there's a lot of reflection that goes with that so i think of uh, uh, um that the facilitation space also needs to be a reflective space so that you're in action doing things, having experiences that are associated with or are going to enable people to inquire into what it is that they're uh, wanting to uh, explore or change or um, develop or, or make a decision around or whatever it is that you're coming together for for that particular purpose of facilitation. However, in that in that evolving space or that emergent space different things will will occur as a, as a result of that and something else may become much more important hmm. you know than what people originally thought yeah yeah or they might discover something that that um is wasn't there in the curriculum or you know they weren't aware of or even the the trainer or the facilitator wasn't aware of Oh, absolutely. I mean, I got involved with many workshops and programs where we start with something and then we end up, you know, in another place. And along the way, we're touching back into, but it, it's certainly a, um, uh, you, you can go off on some tangents uh, because that, that's potentially the right thing to be doing or is the right thing to be doing at that particular point in time because that conversation becomes more important than than a previous conversation or what was thought was needed. Actually, people recognise we need to be focusing in another way right now. So I think you've got to have plans and structures and, um, you know, processes in place and you also need to be able to uh, work with what is actually happening in real time as well Hmm. so how do you keep yourself um from just disappearing off on a tangent to so that you actually come back to address the core issues or the core uh, outcomes that that everybody is targeting well, I think it's it's actually understanding what the purpose is of why you're getting together anyway. So that's the that's the initial thing. So why are we coming together? What is it that mm. you 
want to do and getting a, an understanding of that. So, you know, whoever I'm speaking with, um, you know, we'll, we'll nut that out and, and hopefully I can work, you know, with others who are going to be included because the more that I can engage others in the process, that's a really good thing too. Um, so that when people arrive, they know what they're arriving to and they are informed and they want to be there. And I'll use one of um, Bob Dick's lovely um, expressions about that they're willing participants. And uh, that's what we all want. You know, we want people to be there because they want to be there and they see the value in being there and that this is a positive thing. You know, this is this is not, oh, here we go. It's like, okay, here we go. You know, here's an opportunity to think about things in different ways or this is going to help us do something differently to how we're currently doing it, think about it another way, make a, a different type of choice or decision. Um, so so you have that and then the process begins. And if, if we go off on tangent or if we find ourselves going down a pathway, then it's a matter of checking in, isn't it, to, mm. um, to see are we going off track? And is this important? Is this an important uh, track to go down right now, or do we park this for the moment and recognise that it's come up, but right now it's a distraction, and we need to come back to what was originally decided, or we're saying what was originally decided is n- not as important as what has emerged right now, and we need to really attend to this right now. So you have to have that conversation with the group because at the end of the day, it's really up to the group to decide. And if I'm coaching an individual, it's really up to the individual to decide, you know, what pathway we're on. It's not for me to tell them which pathway they should be on. They have Mm. to make that choice. And so we go down these roads and then it's like, do you want to come back? You know, you've gone off. You said you were wanting to do this. Let's just check in about that. Okay, fine, carry on, or no, let's go back and regroup and get back on with what it is that, you know, was the original focus for why we came together. Mm. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more then about creative leadership. It's sort of, uh, you know, in a way the company name Maverick Minds suggests that it's a bit out of the box, so playing against the rules it suggests to me. So is that part of creative leadership or what what does it encompass well creativity is at the heart of everything i fundamentally believe that and as as human beings we have innate creativity and each of us has a unique way of seeing the world expressing ourselves being in the world making sense of the world and we bring that to our work, we bring that to our relationships, we bring that to our community, we bring it to everything that we do. And so to me it's about harnessing that creativity and recognising what it is and valuing it. And as a leader in an organisation or a leader in a community or a, a leader in a group, it's really about appreciating that of yourself and valuing that and honouring that and knowing that and then recognising that of others and therefore how do you help to facilitate the creativity of the people that are around you and help them to bring what it is that they have to offer because everybody will bring a unique uh, view or perspective and that is incredibly valuable. Then what we do with all of that, the, the, again, that's, the, you know, the decisions that need to be made and um, how you process all of that. But we're not robots. We are, you know, again, human beings with these creative minds that given the opportunity, and we're problem solvers, you know, we're always doing, every day we wake up, you know, and, you know, yes, we might have some routines and certain things that we do, but you know, we're making decisions all the time and kind of improvising and, you know, we're improvising this conversation right now, you know, like, mm, yes. That's right. <laughs> things like that. But there's no script here. And so that that is, you know, we can imagine things 
you know, that's one of the incredible um, capabilities that human beings have is that we're able to imagine and see things and and with that we can bring things to fruition and we can help others to do that too. So, you know, individually we can do that but collectively, you know, we have enormous power. And so as a leader, recognising that and harnessing that and working with people is really what is at the heart of, I think, creative leadership and really what leadership is about. Mm. Yeah, I think you made a really important point there, which is that, you know, we're all creative. I, I know that, you know, people I talk to, and I mean, this might be in relation to writing an article for a website or you know, about their area of expertise, that they, you know, have the knowledge to write the article, or it might be um, drawing. I mean, I know I've said myself that I'm probably the worst drawer in the world. Um, I struggle with doing stick men. So, you know, people put themselves down and, and equate that lack of skill in one particular area perhaps as I'm not uh, creative and yet as you say you know we're, we're all creative because we can have a conversation with people we can come up with ideas I mean people come up with ideas all the time let's do this as a fun activity right now that's a creative idea and I know you talk about uh, developing creative confidence what what sort of things do you do in in the workplace or the business environment to help people kind of feel more confident in their own creativity? It's starting, it, it starts with a conversation and it starts with putting creativity front and centre really. And so I talk about creativity quite a lot in, in the work that I do with people and it's a word that, you know, I'll, I'll use and, and have it there so that people hear it for a start and, and to be able to have the language around it as well I think is really important. And then, of course, in the engagement with people, it's really about giving them the opportunity to show their creativity by some of the processes or, or um, ways that I work with people to let them see that for themselves and, and, and of others. And I, I, get it, I get that response quite a lot from people to say, oh, I can't draw you know, and immediately they think they're not creative because we have this notion that create to, to be creative is to be able to draw or paint. And I, I guess probably to be able to do any of the arts aesthetic work really well, you know, be a musician, you know, all of those sorts of things. Mm. And, yes, that, that is certainly creativity. But we also know that there's artwork that can become repetitive and maybe and a little bit of like painting by numbers and yeah. maybe it's not that creative anymore and maybe it sells too you know there's a market there for it or but and maybe it's creative for that person because that's what they're doing so there's different types and ways of being creative in that regard and i think what's important though is when you bring in some of the arts based processes working with people then you start to see how people can engage in different sorts of ways and it becomes not just an intellectual exercise. Again, it becomes a, a more embodied and holistic way of working with others and people get to see each other and their colleagues in different sorts of ways and they get to see themselves in different sorts of ways because sometimes they'll say to their colleagues, you know, they're doing something, they'll say, oh, wow, look at what you've done. Well, gee, I didn't know you could draw or I didn't know you could sing or you know it reveals things about people that yeah. in a workplace environment often we only see the person as the role that they are at work and we forget that people are much more than that and often so often when you sort of say tell me about a creative something creative that you do oh I play the guitar I'm a photographer I go and do this and I go and do it so people have got these creative things going on in the background and yet often their first response might be that they're not creative because they, they're wrapped up in the role that they do in their workplace and forget about what potentially the influence of their creative work might bring to the work that they actually do. Mm, yeah. Or they do, yeah. they think about it, you know, in a different way. You know, if you're a photographer and you're working in the workplace, how might you, if you start to think about, gee, how does my photography um, or my music on a day-to-day -day basis 
how how does that impact on my life and if I was to bring more of that or aspects of that into the work that I do how might my work change or how might my engagement with the people around me change as a result of of that too yeah yeah that's right I I recall um a few working sessions I had when I was still in the corporate world with team building exercises where there was a bit of creativity brought in in kind of putting together games if you like that involve building things physical something physical with models or so on and exactly what you were saying before happened all of a sudden you saw sides of people that you hadn't seen before because and it was exactly like that well oh fred we didn't know you were really good at building this thing or visualizing this 3d model that that's enabled us to solve this puzzle which you know some of us thought was really difficult and all of a sudden fred said no that's just like this and there are a lot of examples of that that um, really highlighted how you know using a game that was more artistic and engaged different thinking models i guess um, brought out people's skills and people learnt about their colleagues and in team members in a much more broader way and a much richer way as well you mm. know it's definitely um and we need to be if you you know if we're creating um learning experiences for people or or opportunities for people to problem solve or to generate ideas and things like that if if you just stay purely in that intellectual way of being and and words i mean we're very reliant on words and and that can get in the way sometimes so sometimes actually using a diff, another creative method cuts through things in different sorts mm. of ways so i work with images a lot and images are very very powerful you know they tell stories really quickly and people cut through um and kind of reveal things or tell things in very different ways than if you ask them to talk about that from just a purely, I guess, intellectual or word-driven, you know, way. Um, so the, the stimulus that it gives and the, and and also then it links to often sort of storytelling and, and, and what have you. And so, you know, it creates a much more holistic way of, of, of working and it's much more fun and interesting. I mean, it can be confronting for people sometimes, you know, I, I, I'm aware of that because when you ask people to draw and, you know, when I do some of my design thinking work, you know, I say to people, you're not going to be writing this down all the time. You're actually going to be drawing some of these and people go, oh, no, you know, no. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I say, I know everyone can draw stick figures and symbols and circles and squares and things like that. And it's really amazing because then people start to actually, when they talk, so often what I observe is that people go back to that drawing and they talk about and they're, they're, they're focused on the drawing while they're talking, but they are talking about the drawing and, and, the, and the image that's there. They haven't mm. just put that aside. It's actually informing the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I, we do this uh, empathy mapping exercise, which to um, help our clients understand their ideal client, and we do that on a big uh, whiteboard sheet of paper. and And I tell people, you have to draw this. And of course, yeah. I demonstrate it first, and I so I show you how bad I I draw. But the key thing is, you know, using drawings and symbols and visual representations of something that means something to you and it's exactly as you were saying before people first of all there's a lot of oh no this is really bad I can't draw but then people will get up and describe their their empathy map that they've put together and it's quite amazing the story they'll tell from you know a little sketch or a little diagram or a symbol that they've drawn up and it has so much more meaning Oh, totally. Absolutely. Because if you wrote that out, you know, then it would be, you know, this very, very wordy, you mm. know, document. And, you know, in some respects, that's why we should probably be thinking about, you know, the minutes or reports that we do from, you know, <laughs> it needs to be a lot more visual, you know, rather than, you know, all of these words that in the end people are just kind of reading through and pages and pages of, of the written word 
Um, and then, of course, you know, the written word can be problematic anyway because do we think it means the same thing? Mm, that's right. It's, it's probably as open to interpretation as, as a sketch is by different mm. people. That's mm. right. So we have this yeah. we have a propensity towards words. But then, of course, how useful is that if, you know, and, and, you know, for the people who speak English and it's their first language, then they have a, you know, they certainly have an advantage. Well, what about people whose language is, their first language is something else? Mm. And so, you know, how do you create then, um, I think, to a certain degree, inclusivity? And I think by using different processes, methodologies, ways of working, I think it's much more inclusive in that regard because in some way you will, you, you kind of will get everybody in some way or another, you know, and that's what you're hoping to do is that something will resonate or everything, enough will resonate for everybody at some point in time to be able to make a connection with what's actually going on and it's mm. part of the sense-making process, I think, in that regard too. Yeah. Now you said a few moments ago that you work a lot with images. I'm, I'm curious, how do you select images for a particular topic if you're working through a particular topic with a group and, and you want to use an image to work with that? A few ways. I take a lot of photographs. And so whenever I photograph, I'm always photograph, often photographing with uh, a visual image as it is a visual image to be able to kind of think about I might be able to use this at some point in time in some way. Um, so there's, there's a bit of other thinking that goes on. So, yes, mm. I, I like that image, I like that what I'm seeing, but also potentially I can see how that could be used in another context to tell a story. So I use a lot of my own imagery, um, my own artwork as well. So I create and make art and, um, and and I try and use that as often as I can in sort of different contexts. And that's if I'm actually creating images too for, for people. However, I do get people to create their own images and also to, you know, I've got a range of images that I've purchased from different, you know, organisations like Innovative Resources you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I use images uh, like commercial images as well. Mm. That, you know, you can work with that can be useful in terms of encouraging people to um, use an image as a, a way of introducing themselves or it might be for idea generation or it might be, you know, what's where are you currently at and where do you want to be? So, a, you know, a current self and a future self or a current sort of situation and what would you like the future to be and to be able to project and use an image to be able to because there is that imagination as well so we can actually see that so it, there it is in our imagination but there's a, an image that actually articulates that and you can create a pathway to that in some respects too you can create a story from here to there as well and give the, the steps so there's multiple ways of using images I think they're very very powerful and I guess that's my probably that's my bias in a way to a certain degree having a visual arts design background I I find the visual image the um very very powerful working with people so I'm mindful mm -hmm. of that because there's other there's certainly lots of other ways to to work with people yeah yeah all right. I was fascinated how you do that. And I, I guess I take lots of photos as well. And sometimes I think of um, a story around the photo that could sort of find its way into a business sense. But then I've got so many photos that I can't keep track of where they all are and what might be useful. You have to go through them. Spend a little bit of yeah. time going back over them and just looking at them and even maybe mm. creating a little um, a folder with images that you kind of think could be useful in terms of mm. some of the work that you do you know what speaks to you you know in that regard about uh what's the the message or the story that you know you're wanting to articulate yeah yeah so i'm fascinated um because i know you wrote a, a co-authored a book the story cookbook and you know, you've been talking about stories a bit because one of the things i do is um in one of my solo podcasts is tell a story about marketing and I use my own 
photos in the blog posts that go with that. So I'm I'm fascinated about the transition from that visual image to story. So how do you go about integrating that with the story? Because that that's a very powerful technique, I think. Well, there's one example um, that that I can use. Um, so a colleague and I, Jeff Hill and I, um, had been working on this notion of provenance. And the idea of provenance is that um, it, it really, and, it, and it comes from the arts, it's, it's a, a word that is used to be able to track where an artwork comes from and what's the provenance of that artwork. And provenance is really, really important in terms of the value of an artwork. So if you're claiming that you have a Picasso, then what's the provenance to say that you that actually is a Picasso? They would want to be able to track that and know that. And then, yes, of course, the Picasso that you've got hanging on your wall actually is of that value. But if you can't, if, if for some reason you can't um, track the history of that artifact or that object, then there's question around, you know, who's the creator of that and where that actually comes yeah. from. So we took that terminology because it came sort of emerged out of my doctoral work as well, which is in terms of me investigating my practice because my research was about using practice-led inquiry and understanding my own sort of practice, what brought me to where it is that I am now. And so there was kind of like a storytelling and narrative around that. And then we've kind of worked this idea of provenance that every um, – Every professional or every person has a provenance. We all have a provenance. We come from mm. somewhere and we have a whole range of experiences and all of those sorts of things. So one of the things that I do with um, professionals that I work with is we work through a provenance process of looking back in time and understanding where a person's professional practice has actually emerged and come from and to look at some of the key or critical incidents that have happened along the way but I also encourage people to use images that might reflect that as well so they're making so the the images become a bit of a catalyst to help stimulate thinking and then their own reflection is part of that process and they identify those things and then in collaboration with um, another person you know another couple of people in that in that sharing of you then also go into a process of inquiry and reflection with one another and asking questions to help that person kind of unpack that even more about why, you know, out of pure curiosity, you know, how did that come to be and how did you do that? And it's a very empowering experience for people and really people forget so much in a way, you know, the classic sort of Polanyi um, expression of we know more than we can tell. And mm. so... We forget all so many experiences. And then all of a sudden I've had on a number of occasions people say to me, I'd completely forgotten about that. And as a critical incident for them, it became one of the most important elements that they realised had brought them to where they are now and yet they had forgotten it or underplayed it and it's only on reflection that they realise how profound that experience was for them in terms of, you know, where they are now. And the images can work as a really fabulous catalyst for helping people to kind of see that because of the stories that are presenting in images and it's like, ah, that image kind of represents that in a way. And so you can sort of have the image as, the, as, as inspiration and then your own kind of story wrapped in and around that too. Mm, yeah, that's that's fascinating. I know I know. I know that effect that you're talking about. I recently started um, going back to probably 30-year-old slides of mine to try to scan and digitise them, and uh, I've got thousands of them, so it's a daunting task, but I kind of played around with some fairly old ones and, as a result, looked at some photos that I hadn't looked at for years and years and, and then started thinking about things that, I totally suppressed, you know, they were kind of totally out of my mind somewhere and those memories all of a sudden started coming back. Oh, I'd been to this place and I didn't even think that I'd been to this place and so yeah, on. Absolutely. Yeah, and not only that but actually experience, remembering experiences that happened during that time. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, you know, I mean, Looney does a wonderful cartoon of, you know, that 
uh, people are looking on TV at a sunset and the sunset's happening. Yeah, yeah. Behind them, yeah, behind them in the window. (laughs) Sunset, you know. Why do we take photos? You know, we take photos because they do remind us of things and they help us remember something pretty quickly and and really help an experience. Like smells can, you know, very evocative as well. Mm. So they they generate memory very, very quickly. Um, And, you know, and I'd like to just, uh, you know, put a little kind of note too at the moment that right now in Australia we're suffering from these terrible bushfires at the moment Mm. and, you know, so I feel for the people caught up in that and, of course, all the wildlife. And one of the things that you often hear people say is, I wish I'd grab my photos, you know, because they're such a Mm. powerful the thing for people is to be able to go back to that and look at that and, yes, like, wow, gee, it's such a a recall for us in that regard. Yeah, yeah, well, that's that's pretty awful what's happening right now in Australia, of course, and uh, hopefully by the time this episode airs, that might be history, but, um, you know, at the moment we're right in the thick of it. And And as you say, you know, a lot of people obviously are devastated by the loss of their home and their possessions, but it's the photos that are probably the one thing, apart from their life, obviously, that can't be replaced. That's right. Yes, absolutely. Very much so. All right. Well, um, that's kind of a bit of a down note to end up on, but I think the photography thing is fascinating. Well, I think actually in terms of the world of where we are now and in terms of creativity and innovation I think that what we're currently experiencing is is an opportunity there for innovation and creativity Mm. and and it needs all of us at the table to be part of that process and this is what I think in organizational life as well that we need everybody at the table it's most important And, and if people are being left behind or feel that they're that somehow they're not included or you know, that, you know, when they put forward ideas that those ideas are not listened to in, in some way or another, it's very frustrating for people and, you know, it, beca- it becomes disheartening for people. So so as, as a creative leader, then we need to be able to create the space and environment for people to be able to put ideas forward and to be able to hear those ideas, to be able to know what to do with them, to look at how they are in the context of the business that you have, how do you take those ideas um, and and work them, or ha- or maybe they're not appropriate right now. However, they might be down the track. How do you store ideas? How do you let people know that their ideas are valued? But right now, you know that idea can't get up and running for various sorts of reasons. So you, again, as a leader, you need to be able to have a very good understanding of your of the purpose of your organisation, where it's going, and how these ideas fit or don't fit at this point in time, but also to encourage people to continue to be able to bring their most creative selves to the work that they do and that you really value that. That's really yeah. important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you touched on the bushfires. I think you know, given what's happening today in a whole range of areas, we've, we're, uh, I'm certainly disappointed. I think, you know, if you take the general mood in the press that's represented um, representative of probably most people. I think there's a great deal of disappointment in our political leadership across the board, whether that's in um, world politics, whether that's in world economics, or whether that's in Australia with our bushfire crisis right now. Um, but we all have a role to play and we all can you know, be more creative in how we approach leadership. And I think that's a really important message. Yeah, definitely. And also too, you know, and and if we just take away the 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 idea of leadership, because of course, you know, there's a whole conversation around leadership and um and it can seem, you know, a really big topic in that regard and um and what does it really mean? And you know, we've had all these ways of being a leader and mm. and you know and what you know who's a leader and who's not a leader. And we all all have leadership capability at different points in time. And again, in organisational life, we create these odd structures and hierarchies that tell, you know, one person is a leader, you know, more than a leader than another person and things like that. But actually, when you look around in organisations, you soon get to know who who is also that people listen to and are inspired by and things like that too. So I think the notion of leadership is 
why would people want to be or why would people follow you? Um, you know, they might do so because, you know, that's what your role is, but actually do they really believe in you? And, and I think that's a big part of leadership is to become very authentic in your own leadership. And, and, and when you tap into you, who you are and your, your creative being, you really start to get a sense of who that is and what that can look like and what that can be. And therefore, you know, how you can then work with others to, to enable them in, in, in that way. So we're all capable of leadership at different points in time and we're all creative and can step into our creativity at different points in time in different sorts of ways, depending on the circumstances and the context we find ourselves in, the people that we're associated with, the environment, you know, how conducive it is to that. There's so many factors that can influence how how our creativity manifests too. Mm, yeah. Well, I could uh, go on talking leadership and creativity for a long time, and uh, but I'm aware of the time. So I think it's a good point to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And I've got five questions. Hopefully you'll give us some really snappy answers that'll inspire people to go and do something creative and leadership focused today with what you've given them. Great. Are you, re you ready? Yes. Hit me so with it. Yeah, what do you think is the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Uh, I think there's a combination of things. There's a combination of the, the environment in which you work in. Like if you're talking about in an organisational context, then it's how has the organisation set itself up? And the rhetoric that's around innovation is really interesting. So, you know, really, do people want innovation because it means change and do they really want mm. that? Um, so are you creating an environment for that to actually happen and what what pathways or what sorts of um, opportunities um, and ways do you enable people to be part of that innovation process because innovation comes from people it comes from the creativity of people so how do you create an environment for that to actually happen and um and are you prepared to take some risks in there of course there's a level of risk taking um there's intentionality around that you know what are we wanting to be creative for or innovate for um What's your what's your um, level of blame or failure there? You know, if something doesn't happen, are you going to accuse people of, you know, that idea mm. didn't work? You know, so we know, again, if, if people think they're going to get blamed for something, if it doesn't work, are they really going to put their head above the parapet and, and get it sort of knocked off if something doesn't? So experimentation is a big part of that. And do you have a culture of experimentation as well and, and allowing some improvisation to happen in your organisation too. Structure, freedom, you know, it's a paradox really in some respects. Mm. Yeah, so it's a, the strong point there is really around having a culture of innovation and and the ability to experiment without um, fear of failure in the sense that there's going to be repercussions or penalties, if you like, for failure. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. All right. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? I I think I'm intuitive and so I sort of rely on my intuition somewhat and I'll see something or hear something and it sparks something in me and so I'll look into it and I'll do a bit of research around it or start to think and, and there's something in there that it it's not – it's not like a massive aha moment all the time, but there's something that lands for me where I go, there's something here. And so I'll start to investigate. It. And, and sometimes there can be a quick sort of turnaround on that as, a, as an idea. But sometimes it bubbles away for quite some time. And so, you know, I'll do bits and pieces. So I'll often let things lie as well. I'll, I'll write things down. Um, I've got ideas books. Um, I'll make notes. I'll keep a journal. And then I come back and look at it again. So I'll have works in progress to a certain degree where I'm kind of nurturing things at different points in time and then all of a sudden, you know, something will present itself in a way that I'll think, I'm, yeah, this, is, this links with that and that goes with that and this is the right time for this to actually happen. So I'm working on a little um, 
I'm working on a book at the moment. So you mentioned the Story Cookbook, which is a book that Andrew and I wrote about using stories. Uh, we're going to be putting together another one. That's something that we're going to be working on. However, I'm also working on a, a book of my own about creativity. And it's it's not a big, heavy academic book. It's a, Again, it's a little practical book that I'm exploring. And that's been bubbling for a while, you know, and and I've just been sort of doing little bits every now and again. And now, you know, the momentum is there. So I'm kind of more involved with it now at this point mm. in time. Mm, that's great. So, I mean, one of the key things there for me is you, you kind of keep track of ideas by writing them down and you have a journal and you revisit things a lot. And I think, you know, for me, sometimes I look at old photos as well and there, there's ideas there. So I'll, I'll start to take, I mean, that's easy to do now with phones. So you just take a picture of something that grabs your attention that might be an idea for something and that I often come back to those and get some ideas out of that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Now, do you have a favourite resource that you use most often? Uh, in terms of working with others, with groups, images certainly, you know, like when I'm coaching, I work with images a lot too. Um, there's models that I'll work with um, for scaffolding certain things at times um, and there's some tried and tested models that are so useful, you know, some of the action learning principles, um, the, um, you know, things like the scarf model for, you know, about how we kind of respond to others and things like the ladder of inference. All of those sorts of things I think are incredibly, um, they're really good models. However, uh, I'm fairly, I call myself a, a bit of a bower bird, really. And yeah. so I kind of draw on, or the other word that I've used a, a fair bit is a bricoleur. So I take what's available and kind of see what's useful and and I'll play with it. So I, to some people who might be purists around certain things, I may not be as pure as some people in terms of how they use things and I'll take bits and pieces and reconstruct it and put it together in different sorts of ways. That That is useful to me um in how I work and then often I'll present that to others as well because if it's useful to me I think it might be useful to others but it certainly makes sense to me and if it makes sense to me then I can at least explain it to others and hopefully you know it might be useful to them but one of the processes that I've been working with as a personal one um you know, there's this renovator, this renovator's delight. So there's a guy called Jason Clark who did a TED talk, and I kind of use his notion of the renovator's delight. So when you're renovating a house, um, what are the things you want to keep, chuck, add, um, and change? So I think that's a really nice little metaphor to work with. And the other one is the um, the kanbans as well. And I started working with that, and I find that really good. And I I've got you know my flip charts up there with my sticky notes on. And I have found that quite a useful way of working. And I, I'm a bit of a sticky note person, um, so I have, I have probably far too many sticky notes, actually. <laughs> yeah. But I like the way that I can move them around and take things off and then that's done and that goes into the column of that's done. I pull it off and I go, ta-da. And then, like, there's the column there with all these options and ideas and what am I currently working on, who am I waiting on, you know, all of those sorts of things. So that's quite a nice – I like things that are visual. In that regard mm -hmm. yeah well there's lots of interesting tools there i'll have to check out that ted talk on the renovator's delight <laughs> right. 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 sounds fascinating yeah and kanban is great and um, i'm a big fan of sticky notes as well so we've certainly got that in common now what's the best way to keep a, a project or a client on track well, if it's my own projects, then <laughs> it's being accountable to myself. Um, I do I do work with a marketing person at times and I'm accountable to her. And, and that's partly why I've engaged her a little bit more so that I can be a little bit more accountable, you know, in, in that regard. Um, and But it is really about being accountable. You know, it's my business, you know, so hmm. what I don't do, it doesn't get done really. And so I have to, you know, be motivated and think that it's worth doing and, and stay with it. But I'm fairly, I am a very motivated person in that regard. And when I get a focus around something, you know, that, that really helps. Um, and if I believe in it, then, you know, it takes me through. If it's working with others, well, really, it, it, whose responsibility is it? You know, so if I'm working with a group, it's really ultimately their responsibility. So yeah. it comes down to 
uh, commitments and how we all make commitments around things and then who's responsible for that. So, you know, taking action, you know, with a group, you know, it's like that's your responsibility. You know, if you're going off to work together, that's your responsibility. If you're going back into the workplace after this. So I have to be... um, I'm mindful of whose responsibility is it is at the end of the day and, you know, getting clear on, on that. Mm, okay. And then well, a lot. accountable, you know, really, you know, who, who yeah, you yeah. look at. Yeah, I think accountability is a big thing in, in that. And, um, yeah, there's certainly a lot of value in that. Okay, now I think we've touched on this a little bit, but maybe you can kind of recap. What's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Well, we're all different, you know. Yeah. We, are, you know, the, first and foremost, we're all different. You know, we're all unique, and so I think the fact that we are unique, we're differentiated anyway. Uh, and then, because we're unique, we are going to see the world in different ways, and different things will resonate, and we'll have different perspectives and views. And I think the the notion of curation is interesting here because how we, how we, what attracts us, what we're drawn to, what we notice, what we read, the experiences that we have, all becomes, there's that provenance again to a certain degree, it all becomes a package of who we are. And so when we, um, when we understand what that is and, and know that, we can curate that in a way that is useful to us and potentially useful to to others as well, hmm. and that will resonate for others because we offer a different perspective and view of the world, and we've curated it in a way that's unique because we're unique. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I hadn't I hadn't heard it expressed like that before. Curating our own experiences in a way that's um, unique. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, it's quite again. Right. It's quite powerful because. It, mm. It's not about having to be like anybody else. And, you know, people will either resonate with you or they won't. But if you keep on trying to do things for other people, mm. then you're forever, you know, trying to be what it is for others. But if we, if you come back to finding your path and your way, and, of course, if you're working with clients, that you know, of course you've got to sort of work with them. But at the end of the day, what we hope is that people are working with us because what we offer and what we do resonates for them and it's partly about who we are as people. Yeah. Yeah, which brings us back to the human connection. <laughs> exactly. All right, well, yeah, thank you, Catherine. This has been really great. Now, where can people find out more about you and the work you do and uh, learn about your books and maybe even reach out and say thank you for what you've shared today? Uh, they can find my uh, website, Maverick Minds, which is www.maverickminds.com.au. I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Dr. Catherine Lloyd at LinkedIn. Uh, I do have a Twitter handle, and uh, that's at uh, Catherine at Maverick, unders- Maverick underscore Minds. Um, you can subscribe, people can subscribe to Maverick Minds newsletter. I don't bombard people. Uh, I send a newsletter out every now and again. Um, and there's information on my website that might be useful to people to have a look at, and I endeavour to update that as much as possible. Um, and certainly the newsletters is my big focus for this year is to get a few more out because I didn't get as many out as I probably wanted to last year. So this year I'll have a little bit more of a focus in getting, in communicating in that way. Okay. So, and we'll have links to all of those in the show notes so people can click straight through and um, find them even if you're listening to this episode in the car. Yeah, great. All right. Now, what, what sort of final piece of advice would you like to leave the listener in terms of, their leadership aspirations and innovation and creativity? Fundamentally, I think we all need to be curious. I think curiosity is a big thing and remaining curious because the moment we stop being curious is then we stop learning. Um, We've already made a decision or a judgment around something and so you know, we potentially miss what's available to us in that regard. So I think curiosity as a leader 
is really, really important. And recognising that as a leader, you don't have to solve everything. It's not your responsibility to do that. That's where facilitation comes in. How do you mm. facilitate others and the environment for people to be able to step up and make decisions and do things like that? Leadership is about vulnerability, some being humble as well and recognising that good ideas can come from anywhere. And if you're curious and you're listening, you're going to hear some really wonderful ideas from people and, um, you know, and encourage them to take that idea and run with it or to explore it in a way that's really useful to them or to your business or to the group that they're working with in that regard. So, yeah, I think that's quite a, a – and listening. Listening is a big one. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think curiosity and listening kind of go together in my mind. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, that's that's really great advice. And I was just reminded um, we have a couple of cats that are our pets and, uh, you know, they say curiosity killed the cat and sort of anything unusual going on, they're always curious. And it, it always amazes me that, you know, we think, oh, isn't that cute? The cat's really curious. And we think, well, it sh we shouldn't think that's sort of out of the norm we should all be curious we should all be curious you know like mm. in, in, in some respects we should all be in awe of of what we have and what we are because it's mm. really quite remarkable if we actually step back from this is and this is why also the other thing I would say as a leader that reflection is a really important component to be a reflective leader spending time reflecting is so important if we're caught up in this world of busyness and rushing from one thing to another all the time, it's not helpful for ourselves and it's not helpful for the people around us. So good leaders need some time out to reflect on what is it they do, why do they do it, understanding what drives them, what motivates them, you know, what inspires them. What is it Socrates, you know, said about a life unexamined, you know, to examine our lives is a very uh, profound and powerful thing that we need to do for ourselves and to be the best that we can for ourselves and for the people around us, really. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice. All right, well, finally then, Catherine, who would you like me to chat with on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Oh, there were a few people I had in mind. So this is this was very <laughs> difficult, so I'm happy to give some other names at some point in time because I'd love you to have a chat with these other people too. But ultimately I came up with um, a fellow by the name of Andrew Barnes. Andrew is the founder of uh, Perpetual Guardian and he it's a, a New Zealand-based business and he had an epiphany of the four-day working week and decided that he was going to introduce that into his organisation. And he presented that idea to his staff, to the employees. He said he didn't know how they would do it, but he thought it was a good idea and wondered if they thought it was a good idea. And, of course, everybody did think it was a good idea, mm. but how would it actually happen and what would they do? And it's a great story and they have introduced it. They've done some marvellous research around it. They've had universities coming in and researching and he's just released a book as well. Uh, he calls himself the architect of the four-day working week and he has a book out. I think it's just been launched as well. And I have a conversation with Andrew because I think he's such an interesting fellow and he has a military background but he has an artistic family and there's all this... It, yeah, he's. I've spoken to him a few times and had some communication with him because I'm. I was fascinated with because I'm a great believer that we need to have a four day working week. <laughs> yeah. a wonderful thing and a great idea. And he shows that businesses can function as a four and and actually do more and be just as successful, just as productive, efficient, and probably even more so because of you know people are rested and have. They're working mm. on some other things as well. So great story there. Yeah, sounds fascinating. It's, it's interesting because I I was, I came across something in, in my feed, but I haven't actually read it yet. I'll have to go back and find it again now that was about a business that decided that Wednesdays would be um, a day off as well. 
so that essentially they went to a four day working week, but I kind of parked it to read later. But I'll have to go back and find that one now because it sounds like it might be related. So, yes, it's worth investigating. But Andrew, he's, he's a great guy and, and definitely worth, he'd be a, a great interview for you. All right. Well, thanks, Catherine. This has been absolutely fascinating and I've really enjoyed having a chat with you about all things creativity and exploring kind of how images and photography come into storytelling as well as on creative leadership and and how we can all make some change in the world by being more creative leaders and being more curious. So thanks so much for sharing your time and insights with us today. I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Oh, Jürgen, thank you so much for the invitation and thanks to Bob for putting me forward and I really value the opportunity and it's a wonderful opportunity to do a little bit of self-reflection in that regard. So you're providing a wonderful a wonderful service. <laughs> <laughs> Bye for now. Thank you, Jürgen. hope you enjoyed that insightful and really informative conversation with Catherine and took something away from her episode. One of the highlights for me was how Catherine uses her own photographs to weave into stories that become metaphors for a particular lesson she shares with her audience. I'd love to know what you took away from Catherine's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Catherine Lloyd that is C-A-T-H-R-Y-N-L-L-O-Y-D All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Catherine Lloyd. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Catherine there as well as links to the Maverick Minds website, to her social media pages and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. Catherine suggested that we have a conversation with Andrew Barnes of Perpetual Guardian and author of The Four Day Workweek on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So, Andrew, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Catherine Lloyd. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. But most importantly, it will enable you in less than 30 minutes to gain absolute clarity about who your ideal client is and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into Marketing Mastery, or our help with producing your very own podcast, even launching your very own podcast if you don't yet have one, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we can set up a quick call to have a short conversation and find out whether we're a good fit for one another. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast, where we have more fantastic guests lined up, including business strategist Ken Foster, author of The Courage to Change Everything, and Dr. Jeff Spencer of Corner Man Coaching. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe. I N N O V A B U Z Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions, or questions you have, so go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jurgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. Thank you.